everyone. I'm Jonathan Firth. I'm a co-developer at JBoss, and I work on the Arrive project. Hey, I'm Christian. So this talk is about building large-scale and maintainable web and mobile applications with the JBoss Arrive framework. Um, so before we start, we, we have to share some bad news. Someone very close to us cannot be with us today. Yes, I'm sure you all heard the news back in 2009 when the Java programming language ended. Um, that was a sad day for all of us, of course, as Java developers. It was extensively covered in the blogosphere, and I'm sure you all read all about it. So that was sad. Yeah, and it didn't end there. Shortly later, the Google Web Toolkit was on the same bus, and it passed away shortly after. Yep, and uh, of course, something else a little more topical for this particular presentation, uh, the Arrive framework, which stood on the shoulders of giants, left scrambling around in the underbrush, and it got squished. So, so they said, are we done? Can we go? Is it over? I guess, well, according to the news, I think, I think we're done now. Should I, maybe we should ask the audience, maybe? Yeah, I think something's wrong. Does anyone here use Java? <laughs> Every day even? Put up your hand, no? Okay, well we got about 25% of the people here at the Quick Conference using Java, so. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I guess, I guess it's they do not believe everything that's in the media and that we still have our jobs and can continue to work. Yeah. So speaking of our jobs, being a web developer is actually quite hard. Why is that, John? Well, uh, for one, we get big teams. We work on big teams. I think the, the, the key, keynote this morning said the average team size is eight for GWT people. That's a pretty big team. And they tend to get even bigger as apps grow. I talked to someone yesterday who had a 30-person team. and. Then we have these problems. Who's working on what? How do you effectively communicate with each other? Especially if you're segregating your skills into, into design and front end and back end. These separate teams build their own little castles and come up with their own words for the same concept. And soon we can't talk to each other at all. Plus we've got the code rot, just something you wrote last year. Stuff changes around it in the environment and now it doesn't work. Right, we have to deal with large and complex code bases. How do we know where code is actually being used? How do we know what can safely be refactored, can change without breaking existing APIs? And that picture, by the way, is not the architecture that we recommend for an Arai app. <laughs> and again, we have this problem of code rotting away. Yeah, we also get big customers, and we love big customers because uh, we get big paychecks from our big customers. But uh, they'll often cause pain as well for development teams uh, asking for big things on short deadlines, uh, asking to say add mobile support to an app that's already been under development for years, and uh, throw performance problems at us. Like we often don't test with the same amount of data that a big customer is going to actually put in our app or the same number of concurrent users. So this all makes our lives a little more challenging. Right, so how can a framework in general and how can Arai uh, specifically help with all overcoming all those obstacles? What can we actually do? One thing in Arai, we use the best tools and standards for the job. So we think that using HTML or HTML5 and CSS for layout is clearly the most direct way to design a web application. So we use that. And we use Java for enterprise development and Java EE specifically because it solved years ago and it's still solving all those enterprise concerns like persistence, transactions, security. So why not just use that? Why reinvent all that? And we use JavaScript where we absolutely need it. Yeah, we also think uh, with Arai uh, that code sharing is something we can help you accomplish with your app. So we try to get the most amount of code uh, shared between client and server as possible. And this is really just an extension of the don't repeat yourself, the dry principle. Um, you don't want to be cloning other people's code. You don't want to be writing your client and your server code bases in different languages or against different libraries. Uh, you can solve the fragmentation problem by keeping it all in one, one language and common API. And of course, uh, data model and validation logic are a great place to start with shared code. Right, and we bust boilerplate wherever possible. So we, we really think that a declarative and simple programming model can go a long way where you can just write a few lines of code and have more time implementing your actual requirements instead of constantly dealing with technical concerns. Yes. So 
So we've, we've said a, a few things that really sound strange to me. It sounds almost like I'm in a Node.js presentation. <laughs> yeah, it sounds that way. We're talking about same APIs, same language on the client and server. Um, but of course, there's a big difference between Node.js and Array, and that's the, the language we prefer to program in. So right. we think Java still wins for a lot of reasons, the, the type safety, uh, refactoring tools, IDE support, uh, code analysis tools like find bugs and PMD. We can run all this against our client side and our server side code. And of course, look around the room, all the people here at the conference, we're battle-hardened Java developers. We can make big apps that scale well and are maintainable over the long run. Right, so we're gonna just quickly look at the core concepts of Arrive, some code examples. But we plan to do a live coding exercise for at least half an hour. So this is just to get us started. So I already mentioned we're using the best tools for the job. So we use plain HTML templates. The idea is that you can take an HTML file directly from your designer or brand team and use it as a template in your application. So what you see here is actually a valid HTML file and the no custom attribute, no source code in there, and you can use that as a template. And the big advantage of this is because we don't put any source code in this, when you get updates from your designer or design updates in general, whoever's responsible in your team, you don't have to merge in those changes. You just override that HTML file. So where, where's the code? So we put the code in a companion Java class that we annotate with templated. So by default, this complaint form will look for a complaint form.html in that Java package. And then we simply provide access to these fields in the template using dependency injection. So we just inject the fields of the template right into that Java class. So something else, a uh, concern for all of us is that when we're making web applications, we don't want to take away our users' browser powers, the ability to bookmark a place and to use the back button and the forward button to navigate between places we've been in the app. So in Array, we do this again in a declarative way. Uh, you declare that any widget, any GWT widget is a page, a place you can be just by sticking the page annotation on it. So in this case, we're extending the previous example, we're using one of these templated widgets, but it could really be any widget. And to navigate between pages, we use, uh, again, it's declarative and it's type safe, check that compile time. You inject a type called transition to, and you use the type parameter to say where you want to go. And that's checked, of course, that has to be an at page class, that's the target. Um, and then to actually cause the transition to happen and to update the URL in the browser, you just call go on the injected object. So you can't make broken links using this system because your app won't compile if it's got broken links. Okay, another task that takes a lot of boilerplate code in traditional rich web development is data binding. So every time the UI changes, you have your event handlers that update the model, then the model changes, and then you have to update the UI. And it's a lot of tedious, boilerplate heavy code you usually have to write for it. That's why a lot of frameworks provide uh, data binding support. And Array 2 has a two-way two data binding module. And all you do is you inject a model. In this case, it's a user complaint object and you mark the fields that you want to have bound to the model with bound. That's all. From there on, the model and the UI are kept in sync. So when you change the model, the UI updates. When you update the UI, the model updates. And this is fully type checked. So again, it will fail to compile. Let's say, if there's no field called name in your data model, or I will just say, well, you have to either specify an alternative field using an attribute and annotation, or I can't compile this. So no nasty surprises at runtime. Uh, before I talk about events, I think we had a question. Right. Uh, you actually get the choice. Um, what, the way that uh, all of these widgets work, um, they're they're beans. They're CDI beans, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but um, you, you can choose by the scope of the bean. If it's an application scoped bean, then it will be recycled and it will stay in memory. And if it's a dependent scope bean, a new instance of it will be created every time you want that page to appear. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, great. So uh, on to type safe distributed events. 
So what we've done here in Arai is we've implemented the CDI eventing mechanism. It's gonna look kind of familiar if you remember the transition to that we were just talking about. So to be able to fire an event, you just inject the type called event and you use its type parameter again to say what kind of event you'd like to be able to fire. So in this case, it's a document event. Okay, so how do we fire them? Just call fire. So when you're firing a document event, you just supply an instance of document that you want all of the observers to know about and the framework does the rest. So how do we observe? Well, again, it's, it's typed, so you just create any method that takes one parameter of the type that you want to observe and you annotate the parameter with at observes. And so now every time somebody fires a document event, this method will be invoked by the framework. Um, that's CDI, everything I described there already works in Java EE6 and up. But uh, with Arai, we've extended it a little bit more and this is also, uh, the word distributed is key, this is also a way you can communicate between the client and the server in Arai. So if, say, the firing updated doc event.fire was on the server and this observer was in the client code, that will cause a broadcast event out to all the clients who are observing document events and they'll all get a uh, push update right away. Uh, the reverse is also true. If you fire this event on a client and there's an observer on the server, then the framework will move the event up to the server. Yeah? What you have to do is just annotate that event class, like the event type you fire, in this case document, you just mark it as portable, which is an array annotation that tells us you wanna have this sent over the wire. So you can opt in, you have to opt in with your types. We don't by default send all your events across the wire. Yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about Okay, so We've already seen that you can talk to the server using CDI events in a very loosely coupled manner. But sometimes you want tighter coupling. Sometimes you know exactly what you want to do, right? Read all customers or create a custom on the server. That, that's why Arai has an RPC mechanism. And that RPC mechanism works either using our message bus or it works using plain REST. So all you do is you inject a caller, for, in this case for a type, user complaint endpoint. And that user complaint endpoint is just a Java interface that's either decorated with Chucks RS annotations, which is Java standard for RESTful web services, or it's just a remote interface. And then all you do on the client is you simply invoke a method on that interface. So we just say endpoint call, create, and pass in the model. And this really looks like a local method call, but it does all the RPC uh, for you. It does the underlying communication and serialization logic. Either doing that REST interaction that you have defined on the interface or a plain RPC request. There's yep. no async interface or anything. Okay. There's a question? Okay, so the question is what do we use for serialization when we're talking to a REST endpoint? So by default, um, if you don't configure otherwise, you will use Arise marshalling, which is JSON, uh, with some enhanced type information on the wire. But you can use Jackson as well. So that's the two. Yes, you can share. You can share all types you exchange over the wire between the client and the server. Okay. All right. So JPA, we talked about this a little bit in the keynote, but uh, just for a refresher, um, if you want to take your entities, your at entity classes that you are already using on the server with Hibernate or OpenJPA or whatever persistence provider you're using, and now also use them in the client and be able to store and retrieve them. You just put them in your shared package, and then in your client code, you just use at inject entity manager. It's the normal entity manager interface. And now you can 
call methods on it and, and do things to entities. You can store, delete, uh, find by ID. Uh, you can create named queries and plug in parameters and execute them and get back a list of entities. Um, and of course, once now you have all this stuff going on in your clients, every client's got their own little bit of data that you've persisted locally. You've got the problem of uh, how do I get this data between the client and the server? How do I make sure that they're in sync? What if somebody updated something on the server when the client was offline and so on? So we also have this thing we call the client sync manager where uh, the client does most of the work to keep it easy on the server that the client will figure out what has changed locally and send a diff to the server. The server will look at that diff. Uh, if there's any conflicts, it responds with a list of the conflicts and sends it back to the client. And when that exchange is over, uh, depending on what the client does with the conflicts, um, now the client and the server for a particular query have the same entities. So we'll get into that uh, in the demo. Okay. One last feature before you can get ready to build the app is mobile support. I heard that that's very important. Everybody talks about it. And in Arai, we have special support for injecting low-level hardware devices. So you can simply inject the camera object and use it to add pic taking a picture or whatever support you want to add on your client. And you can also, using the TDI venting model we've just seen, you can observe low-level hardware events, like your battery low event or offline event, and then react properly. Okay, so this is where it gets risky. <laughs> um, so because there was a little much to take in, what we're gonna do is, clips here. So we're gonna start building out a simple application to file user complaints and design it with HTML. Um, so I have a pre-built HTML file here that our designer gave me. And I'm just gonna drag that into Eclipse. Let's copy. So I'm probably too small for you, so you can see that. So I put it right into the client.local package, so a client-side quit package. And just wanna point out again that this is a plain HTML file, so you can open it in a web browser. It renders just fine, no templating engine required. It's just HTML. And if you open it in a HTML editor, we actually see that this is just plain HTML. Okay, so I'm gonna add a template to the application and Charles is gonna explain what I'm doing. Okay, so the first thing Christian's gonna do is create a Java class that has the same base name as the HTML file that we just looked at. So it's called complaintform.java. Mm -hmm. And now we have to do two things to tell Arai that this is the companion class to that HTML file. We have to extend the GWT type Composite, which is a, it's a type of widget. Composite extends from widget. And we also have to say at templated. And then there's this optional argument to the templated annotation, which we're going to use in this case because that was a full HTML page with like all the trimmings. It has a header section and, and a body section and so on. What we care about is the root element inside of there that this template is based on. So in this case, we're choosing the app template element. Which is so, yeah. Yeah, just that diff in here. Right, so that's the root of our template. We're ignoring all the stuff that's outside of that diff. Okay. So this is also a place we can be in the application. So we have the page annotation. And every app needs exactly one default page, which is the page you get to if you haven't said which page you want in the URL bar. So we've made this the default page. Okay, so if I switch back to the dev mode window, obviously right now is an image. There was nothing, our app was empty. So now if I refresh this, hopefully, um, we should see um, the page render, um, the app and the template. There we go. So we now have a UI but we, don't, we haven't achieved anything yet because we don't have access to the field. We can't really add any behavior. So let's do that next. Right, so we'll make this companion class do something. So what Christian's doing now is getting access to the DOM elements that were in that template and injecting them into the Java class so we can do stuff with them. Now, 
Uh, Ryan knows how to, how to map DOM elements to GWT widgets. Um, so we're going to use the GWT text box widget type for the name and email input fields. And we'll use a text area for the complaint because it's a multi-line area. You can also use the W3C element API for this, but we prefer the widget API. It's less nasty. Okay, we've got a button too. And so now this is, for people who've used UI Binder, this will look very familiar. To handle events, we just declare that a particular method is an event handler, and we say which widget it handles events for by using the field name. So this is an event handler for the submit button. And we say what kind of event we want, again, uh, just by putting the event type as the parameter. So this means we're, we're gonna receive click events every time the submit button is clicked. So again, the fields, the data fields, I've injected it here. By default, their names line up with here the IDs of the fields in the template. If you want otherwise, you can specify that on the data field annotate, on, on the annotation. So here you could say, provide an alternative name. Okay, so let's refresh the browser again. Oh, I didn't break something. Okay, let's see if that event handler is doing its thing. Time for me to get a new MacBook, I think. <laughs> a little slow. Oh, it's crashing. <coughs> Not usually that slow. Okay, so now we click the button. There. Yay. We added behavior to the template. So there's still stuff missing. Obviously, we want to get access to the data entered in that form. And that's where our data binding uh, module comes in. So we're quickly gonna add data binding support to that form. So, so first thing, yeah. Oh, go ahead. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm injecting a data model. And that's our user complaint for that model. And maybe mark that private. Right, so the reason we're doing this, the reason we want to use this declarative data binding is so that in the event handler, we don't have to go and ask the name field for its text, and we don't have to ask the uh, complaint field for its text, and so on. We, we would like to just have the contents of the form represented in the model object, the user complaint object. And if you look at that user complaint object, that's actually a JPA entity. That's the same class you'd use on the server to persist it in your database. And its fields are named uh, in a familiar way. Yeah, so we got those fields named the same as what we called the IDs in the template and in the companion class. And again, that's optional. Of course, you can choose whatever name you want. The names can be different. So now we simply add the bound annotation to this three fields. So this is uh, a type safety feature, really. We're specifically saying which of the data fields we would like to bind to the model. And that way, Arai can Oh, thanks. <laughs> Good one. Uh -huh. Yeah, you. so now Arai can, can fail the build if somebody, say, changes the name of one of the fields in the model class uh, without updating the template, the apps just won't build anymore. So you don't, you don't get the properties coming unglued without noticing. Right, so let's definitely refresh one more time. Hope it finally speeds up. It's usually a lot, oh. There it goes. I don't know why I was slow before. It's too early in the morning. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so now we fill out that form. Me again. That's not my email address. <laughs> okay, so if I submit this now, there. Our pop-up is now containing all the data and has populated the model with all the data from the form automatically. Of course, it happens every time I change something. And we, yeah, we just, we really didn't have to write any code for that. It's just all using annotations and no, no source had to be written, really. 
Yeah. Something we're not showing here that also would work is if, if somebody called a setter on that model object, the contents of the form would update right away. Right. So I'm going to pass oh. forward. Yeah, it can be. Uh, what we've done here is in our Gwit host page, we've had the link to the CSS, but we also put the link to the CSS in a, like a relative directory uh, from the template. So that part is outside of the root div that we were using, so it's ignored when we're com composing the template. Did you add um, style and header and were including the style Yeah. Yeah, you would end up with a style element uh, in your DOM when the when the template gets composed. Generally, what, what we've seen is that people factor their styles out and just do keep them in the host page. Yeah. Okay. So in the meantime, I've just quickly fast forwarded the Git tag to bring up the rest of the UI, or to bring in the rest of the UI, because it all works the same. The way we just, we, we don't want to bore you with building the, another UI, it's exactly the same uh, annotation. So the next step is we want to take that, take that user complaint model and send it to the server. We want to persist it. And we've decided for that demo to use a REST endpoint. Um, take a quick look at this. So this is our Juxa REST interface. Very simple user complaint endpoint has a create update and delete method following plain REST principles. And that interface is implemented on the server. In this case here, it's implemented, implemented in an EGB, but it doesn't have to be. You can, as soon as you implement it on the server, it exposes that REST endpoint. We don't have to use an EE container if we don't want to. And now we're going to use that interface on the client to invoke an endpoint method. So I'm go back to that complaint form, and Jonathan's going to take over. Oh. Sure. So now to use this REST endpoint, we need to inject a caller, and we say what kind of thing we want to call. We'll put in the REST interface as the type parameter. So now what we can do is we can use the injected endpoint. We can say endpoint.call. And the type of call will be complaint endpoint, so we can call any method on it now. Works great with autocomplete. There. So now because we're sending a request to the server, unfortunately, we can't really block the one thread we have. We have to pass in a callback. That will look a lot nicer, obviously, with Java 8 supporting GWT. Um, but for now, we have to pass in a callback, and I'm going to pass in a response callback. Right. So this is how we receive the return value when it happens. Oops. So we'll get that Eclipse to write that method for us. Okay, and when we receive a uh, response, we want to navigate away to a different page. Okay, thank you for submitting a complaint. Right, so we'll need to inject a transition to object, and the type parameter will be the class of the page widget that we want to go to. So I think we have a thank you page, or it's, yeah, complaint submitted, right? That's what it's called? Okay. Looks good. And all we do is say, go. Right. Right. So. Let's see. I'm also going to need to prove that this is actually persisted. Here, let's open our console, our server console. We should see Hibernate persisting the entity. And we need to refresh one more time. See how long it takes this time. <laughs> oh, that's not fine. too bad. I'm using Jonathan's name. Okay, 
So if we submit this now, there we go. So we've navigated away to the to the to a page, and hopefully, yeah. So we've seen Hibernate persisting that on the server. So the REST endpoint was involved. You took the entity that we sent across the wire and just persisted it. Yeah, and you can also see, uh, or you can't quite see the URL bar updated. Oh yes. Because we transitioned to the complaint submitted page. Oh, that's too small, probably. So we see that that URL fragment was appended to the URL. So you get a bookmarkable URL every time you transition from one page to the next. Okay. We had a question. Yeah, I use the response callback, um, but there is a remote callback. Um, so the response callback gives you access to all the headers, of course, so you can check for a status code and whatnot. But you can also provide a remote callback and an error callback separately if you want to. And there's also a way to hook in a global error callback for all RPC requests, so you don't have to repeat the same error handling ev everywhere. Right. Okay, so that was all very simple. Just wrote one class with a few fields and we got this full behavior with page transitions. Oh, there's another question? Please. So yeah, what I would do uh, in the on submit handler, before we make the call, I would just put something in the DOM there, uh, like a please wait or a pop up or an animated GIF or something like that. And then inside of the callback, um, take it down. So the question is how are the fields of the template bound to the model? And what happens if there are two models? Okay, so if you have two models on the same page, what we usually recommend is to create a, uh, a template that gets two templates injected. So you use one template um, for one model. Because you, you don't have to do separate HTML files, right? Because a templated uh, class refers to just maybe just a div in that HTML file. So you just create one class for that div and one class for the other div, and then maybe one for the whole for the whole HTML file. So would you always bind to one model? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Something else then? Well, you don't have access to this declarative API if you're, if you're building your UI uh, yourself programmatically, but you can use this data binding system. It has a programmatic API, uh, which is all, like when we generate the code for this, uh, we're just using the programmatic a data binding API. So you can use that as well directly in your own widgets. And in that case, you can have as many models as you want because you're programming the data binding. Oh yeah, you can even use the declarative API. Like you can use that annotation to found with UI binder, for instance. That that works. With UI binder, yeah. Yes. But if you're building up the widget programmatically. Programmatically. Yes, then it's better to use the programmatic API yeah. of data binder. So we have a separate programmatic fluent API that you can use if you build your UI in a programmatic way. So you can use all, it doesn't have to be a text box, a built-in grid core text box, so you can use any widget that implements has value or has text, which most do. So you can use this with GXT or whatever you want to do.
that's a tough question. It, it depends on. The, the question is uh, how, how much more size, like how much bigger does the client get uh, with all of this generated code and the templates in it? So it will depend on how many of the array modules you use, like how many of the features. And yes, it adds, it adds to your code size because it generates Marshall for the type. It generates the uh, page navigation graph. It generates the IOC bootstrapper, like the IOC container to inject all that. But you could use code splitting. Um, we're, we're constantly working on improving the code generation performance and making the code smaller. But yes, the code has to be somewhere, and in this case, it's generated. No, it's proportional to the number of managed beans, and this is a managed bean, like this guy. An, an application scoped event observer would also be a managed bean. It will grow incrementally. Yes. You can. Yeah, you can. Tried and we also have uh, a relatively new feature that we're not demonstrating here today. You can use less style sheets. So you can write your styles in less CSS, and those get bundled in with the app. They're compiled to CSS at compile time and bundled with your app as a resource bundle. So the question is if we're using Jin, the answer is no. <laughs> um, because we're using the CDI, or like the Java Enterprise Injection Model. We have to um, be able to statically infer all the injection points, and we actually have our own IOC uh, container. So we generate an IOC bootstrap that wires your bean together. We're not using Jin. But the, the, you use the same annotation. Yes? Yes, that's, you could do that, but you can also um, bind to a property chain. So you could say, my model has a user and it has a name or whatever. Then of course, user would have to be an entity and name would be a string. So the last, the last item in that chain is an actual field, but you can specify a chain there. So how do I how do I lay out or design how? Yes. So you do that in HTML. So you go to the template and make it blue. That's it. Yeah, we preserve all of the attributes on all of the elements. So any styling you put on the element in the template will stay there when it becomes a GUI widget. Okay. More question. Um, so we have uh, list binding support. Well, if we get to it, we probably can show it. Otherwise, I'll, maybe we can talk later or you come to us and I'll show you what we have. So we have to continue, otherwise we won't make the next part of the, of yeah, the demo. We're, we're down to 10 minutes left. So, but the good news is it's the lunch break right after this talk, so we'd love to stay and chat, so. Okay, I'm gonna quickly uh, fast forward and bring in a more sophisticated page. Refresh the browser. 
So what we want to do is we want to have an admin page which lists all the files complaints and they should be persisted into the local storage of the browser, should be persisted on the server and kept in sync automatically. This is like the last part of the keynote, but we wanted to show you how to build that because it actually just requires a few annotations again. Did that load? Let's I see. believe it did. Let's go to the admin page now. There, there's our complaint. So let me browse. Let me open that admin page in the browser. Uh, in Eclipse. Here, so it's a simple templated page again, you notice. And on page shown, what's going on here, Jonathan? Okay, well, uh, page shown is an annotation that's part of that uh, navigation framework where you put at page on a widget to make it a place in your app. Uh, page shown is a lifecycle method that gets invoked after the page widget has been added to the DOM. And what we're going to do in the admin page is first we'll call load complaints, which uh, you can see just above the page shown method is the load complaints method. And so we're using regular JPA2. We're getting a typed query out of the entity manager for all complaints. It returns a collection of user complaint. And then we're just calling on our list widget here, complaints.setItems, query to get result list. So that's a JPA query that's executed locally in the browser against local storage. So we don't need to do anything asynchronous here because this query returns very quickly. So we simply execute the query, get the list synchronously, stick it in the widget, and so when the page displays, we have all of the locally stored complaints display right away. And then right. after that, we start an asynchronous request to the server in case there's any new complaints that we don't know about. And when the server gets around to responding later on, we will integrate those complaints into the list that's already displaying. So we get a nice fast display of all the data that was there, and then when the server gets back to us, we add in the latest stuff. Right, so this does a so as soon as the page loads, this will execute a data sync. Yeah. And that data sync is also triggered here when we observe that online event. So let's say you're on a mobile phone, you go in a tunnel, you disappear, you get out of the tunnel, it will fire that online event and cause that synchronization request. Now, we don't want to wait for the next synchronization cycle, so if somebody adds a complaint and we have number, a huge number of clients connected, so we could directly push, push out those uh, new, da those new uh, data items, which is one of what we're going to do now. Um, if we go to our user endpoint implementation, which is implementing that REST endpoint we saw earlier, it has this create method, and it will fire that CDI event. So it will say, event created, I'll let everybody know that somebody created a complaint. And all we have to do on the client is using that same model, we will just observe that event and take over. Yep, so again, there's, a, there's an event being fired on the server and we want to observe it on the client, so we just create a method, call it anything we want on new complaint, that's a good, good choice. And then we simply say at observes user complaint as the parameter. And now Arai will call this method for us whenever that event is fired, wherever it got fired from. Because this is loosely coupled. We don't know or care when we're in the client where that event came from. We just know what we want to do when it happens. Right. And what we want to do here, um, we're going to merge it into our local storage. This is just like an entity manager.merge call. And we're going to reload the UI to have that list item update. So in order to see if this works, we first of all need to um, refresh the page. So that's, that's not the right one. Um, reload the client. There. And we need a second one, completely new window. So you can see it. And here, it's not really visible. Is it? Uh, you can see it. <coughs> Make it a little smaller. So now if I file a complaint, it should automatically push um, that new complaints out to all connected clients because we're observing that CDI event. We're not waiting for the next synchronization cycle. 
So I hope I didn't break anything. <laughs> so with the parts, I'm submitting this. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. So it's very simple. It's just a few annotations and it just works. Um, okay, that's all we wanted to, wanted to show you in terms of live coding. Let's go back to the presentation. And we really hope that this inspired you to take a look at our framework. And that this is really the beginning of your journey at the end. It's the end of the demo though. <laughs> and get in touch with us. Obviously everything we do at Red Hat and JBoss are open source projects. So we, we love pull requests. We do. And we accept them <laughs> all the time. So don't, don't hesitate to contact us or send us patches or send us new feature requests. And reach out to us on ISC, Twitter. And thank you. And we're here for questions, of course. So the question is, has there been any attempt to roll it into the uh, GWT proper, GWT core? Yes. Um, no, not yet. Um, but we're, op we're open for that, of course. If there's an interest, if the interest is big enough and if the community wants it, um, why not? But so far, um, there hasn't been any attempts to do that. I, I know that it was demoed at the keynote that GWT is working on some HTML templating as well, but they take a different approach. They actually have some sort of uh, the minimal amount of code in the template, and we really don't want that. We want to keep the templates completely clean of any code, so you can really separate out the design work from the actual coding work. So I don't know if there's an interest at all. I think there was another question back there. Not yet, although that would be cool. Um, it, yes, it happens at compile time to answer that question. And um, it, get, it builds, at, when, the, when our code generator is running during the re rebind phase, it collects up all of the less style sheets that you've referred to and uh, compiles them to CSS and it creates a CSS resource during the rebind phase and then that, that resource is packaged with your app. Um, it can even uh, obfuscate, uh, like minify the style names uh, because it knows all the templates. It parses the templates at compile time. So it can minify the style names in the style sheet and the, and the templates. Now that actually creates a CSS resource. Yeah. Not a text resource. So can you do CSS in there? Uh, yes, because, well, all the browser cares about is that the styles are there. Um, I, I don't know if you could programmatically access CSS3 properties from it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you worked oh, on, a, on a large project where maybe the, the services team is a separate team and a separate project uh, with this technology and how do you handle the shared code between them? That's a good question. Yeah. So the question is how do you work with this in a, in a, in a big team and how do you share responsibilities? Um, I'd say it, it depends. We obviously didn't build an app in a big team because we built the framework, but we, we, we think that by making you, by giving the capability a way to share code, especially the data model and the validation logic, you're going to save a lot of time. So basically what I would think is that the back-end team or the middleware team, if you separate out by layer, they provide all the JPA entities, they provide the, the bean validation for those JPA entities. And on the client layer, I have the guys who are good in HTML and CSS that, that build the rest of the app. So that's how I would factor out the responsibility. But I think that largely depends on how your team is structured. Like, yeah, it seems like you probably don't want all of it. I, you could be judicious about which parts you put out into a shared module. Yeah, but again, it will really depend on your team. Like, what are the developers like that implement the client side? Are these maybe even like the same guys that used to do the back end or not? So, yeah. 
think there was another question here. Question is how? Yeah. So the question is how do I use this with MVP? And I have ideas, but it's not working yet the way you would probably want it. And because we had discussions, but we're not even sure um, this lends itself well to the same MVP pattern. To be honest with you, um, this is a lot simpler, obviously, from a design pattern perspective. And if I used MVP, I'd probably use all that features, but I use the programmatic APIs. We haven't yet found a nice way to make this all work with the same annotations, with the same declarative API. It will work if you use the programmatic APIs. Like all of those features that we used with annotations also have programmatic APIs. But we haven't found a really intuitive way to make this work with MVP, which is that background of programmatic, doing everything programmatically and not declaratively. Um, but if there are suggestions, we're more than interested in adding that to the framework. We just haven't had that requested. Usually people start with this and then they stop with the MVP pattern. Or they use the MVP pattern and use the programmatic APIs. But that intersection, we haven't, that intersect, we haven't really discovered yet. Great. So we got our zero minute sign, but uh, it's lunchtime. So we'd love to continue the conversation okay. outside. Thank you.